is a really good friend who I met in graduate school, and I started talking about uh, the last uh, capstone and shred effort for Dave Bell. And John said, I think I've got some interesting people that I've met in Kanab, and there's a possibility here to engage citizenry of Kanab and also a significant employer in the area. I think they're doing something with some like motel thing and I think they've got a few acres of a pretty beautiful canyon and I think they've got some uh, additional purchase that they're looking at for a couple of shacks for employees. And so I said that might be interesting to check out. <laughs> so we took a trip down there and we found the possibilities that you guys are going to discover today. Uh, Kelly Stoll. I'm going to stand up, Kelly. Kelly's Economic Dere Development Director for the City of Kanab. Uh, extension projects always have an outreach component and a significant discovery that the students made and that was already fresh in the minds of best friends people is the very foundational and important relationship between the entire community, uh, including surroundings and a significant in employer in the form of best friends. Matt Brown. Uh, Matt Brown's been a leader for two and a half, three decades uh, in the town of Kanab. He was a developer there, established the golf course, has had several bu business enterprises, and when we investigated what Matt was up to down there, we found that he had done a complete sketch-up model for Main Street in the downtown, which the students thought, okay, great, we've already got some of our work done, but he has been... Uh, a stalwart in communicating with us on four or five occasions about the issues of that are going on in Kanab. Uh, and then I'd like all the other, the great supporters of Best Friends to stand, who are too many to enumerate, so would you guys all stand? Um, in, in my experience in three years, yeah. In three years of capstone effort, there has not been a more engaged client than Best Friends. Uh, and we have some ringleaders. Uh, one of them's name is Patty and Teresa, and people that have really uh, poked and prodded to get all these people to uh, be interested. Once they started getting infected by the be beautiful minds of our students, they have come out in numbers. They've hosted two major events. We had sophomores and seniors camping in Kanab, uh, and full tours given two day full uh, engagements with our students, and then an extraordinary level of interest throughout the semester. So you guys have been our most amazing uh, capstone client. Sean Michael is the department chairman. Sean is back there, and he creates an organization that's connected to the College of Agriculture and Applied Sciences, and that allows the opportunity for this whole thing to happen. So uh, it's important to acknowledge uh, Sean, but the greatest thanks go to our, uh, our graduating seniors, and uh, this is a group that I've had since uh, sophomore year. Uh, we talked about open studio format, critical thinking, uh, being engaged and self-motivated, and they have done that. Um, so they're about to, to treat you guys to a uh, semester's worth of thinking about some things. The essence of our uh, profession is at the most basic level, it's patterns and relationships. It's the patterns and relationships between a geography. You need a geography to find patterns of places. You need a place, uh, town of Kanab, the environs, uh, the great grand staircase, the surrounding national parks, extraordinary context for this project. You also need uh, to engage uh, a population of people this is about the relationship of human beings to a native landscape. In addition to that, an agenda for uh, animal life and particularly a spectrum of domesticated animals for which a significant employer holds a special place in their heart and their business. So without the town of Kanab and the best friends and their value systems, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to find the patterns and relationships between people, a landscape, and the, the values of the people. Uh, so that is uh, really the essence of what we've done here. So we want to thank you all, uh, Town of Kanab and Best Friends, for giving the students an opportunity to work with you. It's been a great, great privilege. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. So I'm just going to briefly go over the agenda for this presentation. So we're going to start out. Andy has a video that he made just kind of doing a br brief overview of the project. And then each team is going to present for 10 minutes. And then we'll have brief comments for about five minutes. And we're going to start with the town team, go to the motel, um, 400 acres, the canyon team, and then connectivity. And then after that, because Dave Bell is on his way to retirement, he's going to do a little wrap up at the end. So we'll start with Andy. All right, um, if, it, if my voice sounds familiar, it's because I was just the narrator for that video. <laughs> um, so I just wanna welcome everybody back to Utah State. Um, my name is Darcy Williams and these are my teammates, Andy Quibman and Joe Nielsen. Um, and we are the Canab City team. Um, so our, our main goal is really to ensure a timeless classic. Um, when we visited Kanab, we noticed a lot of great things, obviously, about Kanab, but um, kind of the main thing we, we really loved about the site is its, it's great location. I mean, it's awesome, centrally located between all of these national parks. It's got a great location, but if we zoom in a little bit more on Kanab itself, um, you can see the strength of this diagram is in the connections of the elements of the town and also um, up the canyon to Best Friends and to the various trails. Um, so another thing that's really powerful about this is kind of the Civic Center and the motel anchoring each end of Center Street. And you're going to hear a little bit more about these throughout our, all of our presentations, really. Um, but also the strength of nature from the canyon and Kanab Creek kind of filtering into the city. Um, so when we visited the um, Kanab back in January, um, not only did we notice, you know, beautiful landscapes, um, and various, various recreational opportunities, but we noticed such things as um, great local retail shops, um, a lot of existing infrastructure, um, really dense tourist community, and uh, awesome, awesome, rich her history and heritage as well. Um, so three things that we believe make up a strong community, or any strong community, really are economy, um, getting people to stay longer, um, housing, creating more affordable housing options, and um, really emphasizing recreation and the connectivity that it brings um, to residents of Kanab as well as tourists. Um, so the three elements that we're going to talk about that kind of correspond with these are first the Civic Center, um, some housing options, and Center Street is our last. Um, so before I move on though, some of the things that we saw that didn't actually um, help Kanab in creating a strong community were such things as, um, you know, a lot of vacant housing. There wasn't a whole lot of housing that was actually for rent, um, which Andy will talk about. They don't really have a big public uh, meeting space that everyone can use. Um, a lot of the tourists tend to just kind of zoom right through. They don't really stay in Kanab. Um, which we want them to, it's a great place. And the downtown's not really walkable or pedestrian friendly. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is um, the Civic Center and its relation to the recreation realm. Um, here's some of the early concepts we came up with. Um, we had a lot of help from Matt Brown. He has been awesome through this process. Um, and this led us to our master plan, um, which includes uh, such thing as the necessary amount of parking, um, I actually want to mention, too, that this um, area is actually from the architects, so we kind of merged our master plan into what's already going to be implemented um, that Kanab's already thinking about. Um, so necessary parking, we've got some horseshoe pits, pickleball courts, and bocce ball areas, but some of the most important um, parts of this civic center are, first, a dog park. Um, we know that the 
The community of pets is growing a lot in Kanav uh, for obvious reasons. Um, an informal amphitheater, we thought this could be used for um, small concert events, uh, summer movies, family reunions, and other kind of small community events like that. Um, a themed playground, we realized that there's a recreational facility actually just up the street, but we kind of wanted to play off of that um, community or that center by um, recognizing that the Heritage Museum is here and giving this playground a, a much more historical feel um, than the existing recreational areas. And last is this gravel pit you get, that's actually kind of up on this plateaued area here that you would access from the east. Um, and when this area isn't being, being used for um, overflow parking or parking for the dog park, it could actually be used for events like you know, local farmers markets or bringing in food trucks and other cool um, events like that. Um, I also, I just wanna emphasize the point of this whole area being a recreational facility for people of all ages. I mean, we've got um, small children, more kind of young adults, and then um, being in such close proximity to the Senior Citizen Center, um, the gymnasium, and the conference center, giving people of all ages a place to go without having to go, you know, out into the canyons or kind of staying in the heart of Kanab. All right, I get the, the fun part. I get to talk about a little bit about uh, Kanab's interesting housing. Um, Kanab uh, is, is set to grow by an extra 25% in the next 15 years. Uh, that's a lot of extra people to be housed in there. Uh, currently, there's a, a lack of rental opportunities in Kanab, and rental opportunities are actually pretty high demand. Uh, I know a lot of best friends, um, employees would prefer to rent rather than buy and um, lower income um, people might prefer to rent, uh, like teachers, or even like uh, teenagers who don't necessarily want to leave Kanab, but they can't afford to buy a house. So uh, <coughs> rentals are a, an issue. And then uh, just an overview that 20% uh, of the houses in Kanab currently are vacant. 50% um, of those are for sale currently and the other half are actually vacation homes. So that leaves us actually quite a bit of opportunity to, to use some of those for sale houses, break them up, subdivide them, two, uh, duplexes, fourplexes, and rent them out instead of just selling your house and getting a, a income from the, a chunk of income, you could actually get a steady income from the rental. Um, we, with that growth, we wanted to emphasize that Kanab has good infrastructure right now. It's, it's got pretty good infrastructure. If you just continue to, to fill it out rather than spread it out, it would uh, it'd go a long way to continuing your, your goals towards keeping a, uh, a small town feel and a close knit community through some of those suggestions. Thank you, Andy. Uh, we're gonna shift our, shift our focus now to the last portion of our presentation, which is um, downtown streets. Uh, through this process and through this project, we've had the opportunity to learn a lot from our, our professors, um, some industry professionals, as well as working alongside with some Kanab uh, city employees. And through that, we've been able to learn a lot, a lot more about what makes a street, success, a street like this successful. Um, and when we're talking about successful streets, we're talking about a street <clears throat> that can facilitate the daily traffic, that is safe for pedestrians to cross and to use, uh, but uh, that also improves the economy of the community um, by providing the downtown area with a place that people can come to gather, to eat, to shop, um, and to, to interact with each other. Um, these are some images here that we have, uh, that we chose, that we thought represented these kind of places um, very well. Uh, before we go into um, what makes these places special and, and successful, let's look at um, Kanab Center Street as it is now. Um, when I look at this, some words that come to mind are big, 
um, uncomfortable, wide, scary. Um, and while it's great for semi trucks passing through, um, it's really not that great for, for much else. Um, so we wanted to explore through our design process um, some better solutions to be able to make this place special. Um, <clears throat> and we have three concepts here um, that you can look at, but they, they're all going to include th kind of the same elements, which are bulb outs, shorter crossing distances for pedestrians, medians, um, reduced lanes or lane sizes, and lastly, expanded um, sidewalks. So you can have a look at these. These are just some of the things that, um, that we toyed around with during the, the concept stage. Um, and ultimately, um, we made our way to this, and, and we know that through, through our process, uh, this is going to be the most um, successful way to, to design Canab Center Street, and just so everybody can get their bearings. <coughs> Um, we're looking at the same section of street here. So this is the LDS church and this is Main Street. Um, obviously you can see here church, church, and then this is the church here. So we're looking at the same block this whole time. Um, <clears throat> anyways, this is what we feel will be most successful for, for the area and it includes those things which I referenced earlier. So you can just have a look at that. Um, this represents another image of the, of the same section. Whoops of the church here as well, same block. Um, this is just illustrating the, the lane widths, the sidewalk widths, um, and the medians and things like that. Now the next image you'll see is going to be from right here, looking this way. And it's a perspective just showing uh, what this place could look like um, and some, some design efforts to help take back this downtown um, center street. We believe that by um, implementing all of these things that I've talked about, that it will strengthen the economy, make downtown walkable, reduce speeds, increase the crosswalks, and hopefully um, better business to keep, um, attract more business to, so that they can be able to stay open later and hopefully through more uh, time during the season. Do you wanna talk to? All right, um, we've actually asked Kelly to help us out. We'll see if this actually uh, this works. We're going to try and put him into a virtual recreation of our design for the down, uh, downtown block. So we'll see if this works. All right. I'd like to thank you all for being here, representatives of Best Friends, City of Kanab. Uh, we're excited to present our design to you. Uh, we are the motel team. I'm Tyson Murray. Margie Height, and this is Kendall Crockett. Um, and so we have the Four Seasons Motel, which Best Friends recently purchased. Um, and so upon our initial site visit, we got to see both Best Friends Animal Sanctuary and the city of Kanab, and we noticed similarities and differences, I mean, things that stood out to bo um, about both entities. So when we got to Kanab, we noticed this really rich, uh, unique um, character of the place, this agrarian, kind of feel on the main street. Um, also this rich history, you know, from the Mormon pioneers to the Paiutes um, coming here for new beginnings. So a really good history. And then we noticed the landscape um, surrounding the city of Kanab. Best friends, we noticed some similarities. We noticed Angel Canyon. Our first day we got there, we had breakfast overlooking Angel Canyon and the Grand Staircase. Um, it was just a beautiful backdrop. Um, and we also noticed the unique history with best friends. Um, they came to Kanab in the uh, 1970s to set up a new uh, animal sanctuary where they could fulfill their uh, goals. So traditionally these two organizations have been seen as having differing views. Um, but upon our site visit we noticed that there was one thing tying them together and that's the landscape. Um, to illustrate this point we look at the context. So here we see the Grand Staircase, Angel Canyon coming down right by um, best friends animal sanctuary. Um, and then if we follow Highway 89 down um, and Kanab Creek, we start to see the Four Seasons Motel. This is our site right at the gateway of the historic district entering the city of Kanab. So this inspired us to look at the common principles that both of these organizations share. Um, and so the history, they both came here looking for new beginnings originally. Um, 
experience. Uh, best friends relies he heavily on their volunteers and visitors to come here, have a great experience, and take that into their communities. Um, we see Kanab as having that same experience um, as like a recreational hub within Southern Utah. And then finally, sustainability. Um, both of these organizations want to see, uh, want to meet their needs currently without hindering the needs of future generations. Um, so let's look at the site in depth. So we, here we have the motel, um, and on the property we also have two different structures, the, this L-shaped structure here, um, and the restaurant on the north. Um, some other important parts of this is the back parcel here, um, 0.25 acres that has been offered and for purchase by uh, Best Friends. And then adjacent here we see Kanab Creek. Um, so originally the motel was built in the 1970s as a live-in motel. So the person who owned the motel took care of it and stayed in the motel. Um, this picture kind of illustrates the condition of the back parcel. Kind of not in the best condition, kind of uh, uh, forgotten about the restaurant, which is currently vacant. Um, and this L-shaped structure here, which is um, not in the best of condition either. And now Margie's going to talk about some of the program elements. <laughs> We've broken the program elements into three separate sections, the pet friendly, motel, and sustainable elements. The pet friendly elements really are key because we wanna make this a pet destination. One of the elements that we're gonna focus in on is the dog daycare with the kitten nursery. This is important because a dog daycare is not currently in Kanab, and the trails surrounding Kanab, as well as the national parks, you cannot have your dog out on them. So you need somewhere to keep them while the family is out and about. The kitten nursery is also um, going to be installed because there's currently not one on Best Friends property and it's an, meeting an unmet need. Part of the motel elements we want to part of the motel elements um, is maintaining the 41 rooms as well as a minimum of 41 parking stalls that's required. And then some of the sustainable elements we'd like to include include maximizing the um, green space and introducing green infrastructure techniques. Our site really does have so much potential in bringing these two entities together as well as the landscape in through the motel core and to the surrounding structures. Going into our analysis, we have another goal of our site we really want to be able to connect. And this um, analysis shows the five, 10, and 15 minute rinks from the, fo um, from the Four Seasons Motel and connects you to green space, including parks and civic centers and um, the trails surrounding Kanab. And we want to connect to all of those from our hotel. We also did a hotel analysis. You can see the Four Seasons in pink and the surrounding hotels in orange. This was very important because 66% of these hotels are pet friendly. However, of that 66, 90% of them require a pet free, which means that they are putting um, a person before their pet's needs. We also saw that 33% of those hotels are chain hotels and of that 33%, 71% of them are in or near the historic district. Chain hotels, while they do a purpose, they do not contribute to the character of Kanab, and we want our motel to contribute to that sense of place. In our site analysis, you can see that we definitely want to take advantage of the views of the canyon. We also see multiple circulation entrances, and one of the main things we want to take advantage of is the back parcel while leaving this um, utility road open on the north side. We went through multiple concepts, which included the high impact, low impact, and medium impact. Um, concepts. We kind of went with the medium impact because it was basically the sweet spot, included everything we needed, which moves us into our accepted concept. As you can see here, we took advantage of that back parcel of land and made it into a dog park, and we also have um, added tons of green space. And a couple more changes were made during our schematic plan. You can now see we only have three entrances into the site um, and different patios for views. Okay, so one major um, principle we wanted to touch on was the idea of sustainability. And so here, this list shows kind of the, uh, some of the elements we've introduced on site that add to the sustainability of the site. Um, first thing I want to talk about is the rainwater uh, roof catchment systems that we have. So on the restaurant on the north, um, that roof water will be pushed to a northern um, planter. Um, and in the motel, for the motel site, we have a system of cisterns um, that capture the rainwater. Um, 
and there'll be a graphic to show this next. And then the doggy daycare um, down here in the south will actually um, drain into the detention basin. So here is a graphic illustrating how that motel roof catchment will work. Um, so we have kind of the, the rain hitting the roof, coming down uh, the gutters into our overhead structure, um, piped across our overhead structure, and then into our sis uh, system of cisterns. I don't know why I said that again. <laughs> um, lastly, on the rainwater catchment, we looked at the parking lot. So we wanted to detain all of the rainwater on site. And this is fulfilled through this system of uh, detention basins along here. So water would run off and come through our dry swales and then into our detention basin here. Um, lastly, on sustainability, we looked at water efficiency. Um, and if best friends were to replace uh, just the appliances like to hot uh, toilets, uh, water washer machines, faucets, and shower heads, they could save over a million gallons um, just by replacing those uh, appliances. Okay, no? All right, I get the fun part of talking about the design. So on the motel, right now you just drive by it and it's not a focal point, you don't really notice it. And if you do notice it, you think, yeah, that's not that great. To make it great, we have added an entry plaza in the front and a rain garden that is 100% pet friendly and it also will have an access for a shuttle to come and take visitors up to the best friend sanctuary. Now on the motel site, we really wanted to maintain that 41 rooms that it currently has. But in addition, we wanted to add on the first floor to have six suites that on the back side have dog kennels that people can come stay in this room and then have their dogs there for the day as they experience you know, the trails or other visitor centers. And then in addition to that, on the top floor have eight suites that on the back end are connected to a catio where you could then have your cat stay you know, while you're doing those activities. Now in this perspective, you can see that entry plaza that we really want to focus on as you're you know, driving in and pulling in. It looks really nice. Uh, and these are the cisterns that look like silos to kind of add to the character of Kanab City. Now on the first floor of the motel, you know, we'd have the entry lo lobby. And then in the back, you'd have office space you know, and then a central gathering area. Now in the top floor, there's a really good opportunity to view the landscape out and so in this front, we'd have a glass area there that, you know, as you're standing there, you can really have that connection of the landscape, as long as a business center and a conference room. So on the back of the site, we would propose a dog park that would have a shallow area that the dogs can play in of water. And this is an idea of what that would look like. You know, plenty of seating for the people to sit down, enjoy watching their pets play. And we really saw an opportunity on the back side of the, the motel to add a tribute to the animals. And so we'd have a mural on this back wall you know, to really show that. Now some examples here, this is what that would look like. Now we have Greg, uh, and, and he's got a short little video uh, to show what this might look like on your motel. project that they recently did in Lagoon, uh, down in Farmington, Utah. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> All right, so really good opportunity, you know, to pay tribute to the animals there. So moving on with some more elements, you know, that older building, you know, 
we just propose tear it down, start over, have this doggy daycare and kitten nursery. And this is what that might look like. Now, so the main idea behind this is you bring your dogs, you might not even have to stay in the motel, but you still want to go and visit the trails. But where do you put your dogs and your cats? You can't take them on the trails. Come here, they can stay here as well as get groomed and have that kitten nursery. You know, and in the front, have enlarged windows that the people can you know, see what's happening on inside. So on the north section, you know, we have the restaurant. There's a huge opportunity to see that landscape out there. I mean, beautiful views. And optimize that, put a two-level patio that's, again, pet-friendly. You can come, enjoy a nice meal with your true family. And then we wanted to connect to the trail systems and also to the downtown area. To do that safely, we propose to put crosswalks on either side of the bend. We feel like that's going to be the safest place to have the most visible for pedestrians and vehicular access. Now, to just show kind of that relationship between the animals and the, the humans, you know, this is what that might look like. You have the motel here, and in the back, you'd have that dog kennel area and the dog park. Overall, our hotel design really does have the potential to bring, or to be a model for the city of Kanab, all of, this, all of the motels in the area, through the history, experience, and sustainable elements that we have included. And on that note, we would like to invite you guys to your pet hotel that is human friendly. <laughs> <laughs> we took your... <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? So that's it? Okay, yeah. We're the, we're the 400 Acres team. My name is Spencer Burt. This is Chris Creasy, Steve Woody. Um, we'll all be addressing you in the next few minutes, like you. Um, so we're focusing on the 400 Acres, like I said, and our big um, underlying message, if you forget everything we say, is uh, we want to create pod-driven communities. Um, so Best Friends Animal Sanctuary um, has a core values um, and community and group feel that was incredible, that we got to peek into. Um, and we wanted to help employees to have that same purpose and drive um, and, and feel and value set in their homes, um, just like they do at work. Um, so this is a throwback to Charette. Um, but in order to keep those values, the values of best friends and also the values of the land um, that we um, have this development on. Um, we want to make sure everything's sustainable. We want to make sure everything um, is low impact um, and, and builds community in the best way that we can. Um, again, these principles and following these principles um, will strengthen uh, the experience of Best Friends employees, which in turn provides a better environment for animals, um, helps spread the message, and ultimately everything comes down to um, reaching the goal of no kill by 2025. So um, that's really, we want to use this development as a catalyst for that. Um, so Best Friends employees um, are incredible. We, we got to meet a lot of them, um, had tour guides, we had every, a lot of people in this room. Um, there's a, a central purpose um, and a focus um, that, that is great on the sanctuary. And it, you feel like you're stepping into a, a whole different world and it's, it, it feels awesome. Um, and then, employees go home um, to their, their sheds, and this is um, in Kanab, so that's probably root beer floats or something. Um, but uh, they go home and to these little housing um, situations, like we said, like Andy said earlier, there's not a lot of rentals, um, so it's hard to find housing. There's a housing shortage for employees, um, and the community and, and different value sets of um, residents of Kanab and best friend employees often is very different, which leads to isolation in neighborhoods. A feeling of isolation, it can lead to that. Um, and so that's something we wanted to fix. Um, we wanted to create a synergy between um, work, purpose, drive, values, this incredible thing. You come from how far to work for this um, and to do something and feel like you're making a difference at home um, where you don't get that as much. We want to make home part of that system. Um, and that leads us to pod-driven communities. So values of pet friendliness, values of a low impact, sustainability, um, and really combining the work and home worlds. So in order to meet these goals, um, 
we needed to advance our analysis that we did during the charrette and a lot of that was focused on the this unique piece of land that is 400 acres uh, we focused on minimizing the viewshed impact from the highway system preserving the endangered canab amber snail habitat so preventing runoff from a development from going into those areas utilizing the existing primitive road system there so we're not making an impact on the rest of the vegetation uh, there is existing power line access as well as uh, cable access and water lines along here so we wanted to take that into account and also building in an area uh, that has a buildable slope. We combined all of those and it synthesized into this location which has good road access, uh, minimizes that viewshed impact, minimizes the impact on the Kanab Amber Snail um, and really puts us in a, an iconic piece of the topography. Another important thing that we wanted to look at was the wind in the area. Uh, these are wind roses, so it's basically showing in compass form where that wind is coming from. So the majority of the more light breezes are coming from that northwest, and that's, a, that's kind of a comfortable breeze, especially in a desert environment. The more intense winds that are, you know, blow your hair back, uh, ruffle your papers and stuff are coming from that uh, southwest area and so this really made us take it uh, into account with the building orientations uh, facing the, the shorter sides of the houses towards that intense wind and preserving uh, wind breaks that are these mature juniper trees in the area um, for that. This also coincided with our uh, solar analysis which allowed us to position the houses uh, northwest to southeast uh, to expose the, the bedrooms and things to that morning sun after a cold desert night and protect them from the hot afternoon sun. And also um, the orientation played into summer sun and winter sun. The summer sun is at a higher angle in the sky, so that can reflect off of the white roofs on the housing, um, while the winter sun is at a lower azimuth and is allowed to be let into the houses for passive, passive heating. Um, so once we determined all this analysis, um, how we wanted to situate the homes, we needed to find the homes, and that's where ZipKit came in. So, uh, <laughs> zip kit homes, what we, well we knew that we wanted homes that were going to be affordable and also low impact and especially since labor for construction on the site is so expensive, we wanted to go with something that we knew could be moved on there fairly easily. And that's where ZipKit Homes comes into play. They make modular, modern units. Uh, they're very low impact. They're also located in Mount Pleasant, Utah. So there's a quick transfer to actually get them there. So that would keep the cost low as well. And on top of that, they customize their homes to the client's needs. And in this case, it would be best friends. So we have these four housing typologies going on from the Terrier to the Dachshund to the Lab to the Dane. Now. Let's start with the Terrier. The Terrier is going to be our smallest, most affordable unit, and that is going to be essentially a 400 square foot and a 600 square foot option. And from there, we get into the floor plan. Now, based on the Best Friends survey, we took the needs that the people want before they move into it, and then we actually were able to meet all those needs within these single units. And now, uh, one thing that we really had to take into consideration with this was the materials used. They need to be durable. They need to last about 10 years before they have to be switched out again, especially with a, uh, a tenants that have, on average, three dogs and two and a half cats. Now, <laughs> here's those tenants right there. We actually walked through these, and they're a lot more spacious than you would think, given the dimensions. And uh, yeah, yeah, there's a half cat in there. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> And so, yes, this is what the interior would look like. Very spacious, lots of room. And let's get to the next one. So the elongated version of the Terrier is the Dachshund. And the Dachshund is going to be 600 square feet, 900 square feet, respectively. To take a look at those floor plans, gives you a little bit more room in addition for other amenities, such as a mud room. There's an option of catteries on all the porches. And there's a ample porch space to give you more indoor-outdoor relationships as well. Now, in respect to indoor-outdoor relationships, the site or the photo in the background is actually taken on site where we're going to plan on placing one of those homes. So for that, we designed a two-story unit that would actually put you off there and actually be able to take in the views of the Grand Staircase Monument from there. And next we have the lab. So the lab is a nice little L-shaped two-bedroom. It's a little bit more cozy and kind of, you know, curled up like a sleeping lab. And once we get into here, we see the floor plan, lots of porch space. So this is people who would be able to afford a higher price point and would want that extra space. 
and then we get to the Dane. The Dane is the largest unit. It's going to be uh, four bedrooms with a shared common space, so it's more of an actual duplex approach. And as you can see, with that much roof space, we actually gain an opportunity for water catchment, whereas the others we might just want to do kind of directional water runoff. And now with that water catchment, we can water the surrounding landscapes. Here's a look at the actual floor plan of the Dane. There's a shade, shared common space in the middle, along with all four bedrooms, broken off into two by two on each side. And now we just got to place the homes, and to cover that is Chris. So we have our typologies, and we have our analysis. Uh, we have our site, but within that site, we wanted to situate these homes in a uh, dynamic way. And we did that through two developments. Our hunkered down development, this is uh, the highest point on the site. It's a high iron hill top. And so we wanted to nestle this community within that hill stop. And then this is our teeth to the wind development. It's looking out at that Escalante Grand Staircase and it's a little more rugged, a little more in the wind, exposed, um, but up there with those views. When we were going through our concepts, uh, we wanted to fit it in without it feeling kind of like a, a subdivision or just a normal cul-de-sac. So we went through a lot of different options and we settled on one that had the roads on the outside and then the housing with uh, yards, private yards in the back and a shared trail system that can bring you into our center community center and connects to the regional trail system on the site. Um, it gives a good sense of privacy with the mature junipers around uh, while still connecting the community members together if they so choose. So our teeth of the wind development, these southern houses are at a higher elevation than the northern ones, so they see over top of the other ones, so it's sort of like a tiered environment, um, while still providing, uh, providing for privacy with those junipers, um, and at least uh, about 80 to 100 feet between units. Uh, while the hunkered down units are a lot more vegetated uh, because they are in kind of a drainage area, we have a swale running through there to catch that extra drainage and it does provide for some uh, unique planting opportunities that aren't available on the more exposed site, which is where Steve will come back in. So for those planting opportunities, we wanted to minimize the addition of vegetation on the site. So we stuck to the more native community of big sagebrush. Now that is shown in the orange and it's mainly to repair existing roads, places that have already been disturbed on the site, and also places that are going to be disturbed during construction. But there is an opportunity to actually give it a little bit more of a neighborhood feel, and so for that we went with an Arizona sycamore, which is native to the southwest. It's a drought tolerant, very large shade tree, and we decided to place those on that southwestern side of each house to actually prevent it from that hot summer sun in the afternoon, and of course in the winter they're deciduous, they lose their leaves and they let the sun through. So overall it would increase the efficiency of the homes, and the best way to actually water those would be through a gray water irrigation of the laundry and that would just pour out directly into the base of the trees. All right, so we'll go into the community center. So what happens if you're in a 400 square foot house and you want to have all these great friends you've met at work over for dinner but Rufus is on the couch and Mr. Pickles is taking up the floor and, and somebody's in the way of the kitchen, uh, you need a good community center. Um, to be able to meet um, with a group. Um, the purpose of best friends and the cause that draws employees here also creates strong bonds and that was something we were able to, to have a window at when we, when we looked. Um, which is why we um, have a community center between the two developments. Um, somewhere with a kitchen, somewhere with outdoor space, you could have a campfire, a uh, patio, you could view the grand staircase, um, different places inside that you can hang out. Um, basically a gathering space. Um, for your friends. Um, if you have visitors, you can come and, and hang out there. So um, this is all tied in as well with the trail um, system. Uh, the previous owner of the site made a lot of roads um, and paths um, and scarred the landscape in a lot of ways, but that has opened up a lot of opportunity for us um, to convert some of those into trails um, and provide a, a great network for um, probably the world's best dog walk, according to us. So you can quote us on that. Um, and there's some key uh, viewpoints. Down here is overlooking an amazing canyon. Here is down at the Three Lakes site. You can actually get down using existing roads and trails. And right here is that Iron Hill that Chris has mentioned um, with incredible views, absolutely incredible views. Um, this is, these are some of the roads. Um, this is actually on that hill. 
So this is the state of the roads, what they look like now. We would um, replant with that sagebrush that Steve was talking about, which would diversify um, the environment um, and the ecology there, as well as provide a more intimate, beautiful place to walk your dogs and to use those trails. Another big as asset of the site is it's away from Kanab City and the lights. And so the night sky is going to be incredible. Um, keeping that impact minimal, keeping the light minimal, keeping the roads unpaved, all these things factor into a more sustainable um, site and a more sustainable home that fits better with um, the values of best friends employees and with the values of best friends. Um, really that's the end goal. We want that purpose and drive and the reason that all employees came to best friends um, to follow them home and to live in their backyard and to live in their house and so that they feel a synergy and they're more willing to plug back in and, and have an easier time of um, being happy through work and helping people and visitors who come and the animals and accomplishing ultimately that purpose of saving all animals um, by 2025. So thank you and we'll open up to questions. Uh, obviously an inspiring encounter with the natural world if you've been there. Uh, fantastic views. Um, so we thought this quote sort of summarized the issues that best friends faced when they first came out to Kanab, but it also sort of uh, summarizes what you're going through right now. Um, voice crying out in the wilderness and a beautiful place, of course. So um, encircled by national forests, monuments, recreational areas, trailheads, everything. Um, all these places bring in millions of annual visitors, but they sort of slip through the cracks when it comes to um, staying in Kanab. And I feel like that's what we're trying to accomplish is um, creating a destination, um, a more unique and compassionate community, I think is what's gonna help um, make the destination. So to make the destination, we decided that consolidation of facilities, um, clarifying the landscape and uh, showing reciprocation uh, were the best ways to accomplish that. Uh, when we visited, we saw that it was uh, growing in an organic fashion, which is great, but um, over time it's become slightly disconnected and um, a little more confusing for people, especially if you're visiting for your first time. Um, so some of the issues that we uh, thought we could solve were the consolidation of the facilities, um, making it more navigable for uh, employees and visitors. And uh, this would ultimately lead visitors to becoming volunteers or donors or even employees. Uh, helping you guys fulfill your mission of no kill by 2025. Just a little louder, please. Oh, sorry. Well, good thing it's on the lawns here, so. <laughs> okay, um, so with those goals that Tyler was talking about in mind of uh, bringing those first time visitors into the sanctuary, giving them an, an inspiring experience, um, helping them to become volunteers, later on donors, etc. cetera. Um, we looked at a variety of things when we went down there and then um, in the following months as we've been working on this project. So um, the first kind of thing that we looked at were existing visitor areas um, on the site. That's this diagram here on the left. Uh, and so obviously we have the visitor center down at the bottom. We have a little bit of a trails network with some uh, fairly popular destinations um, for, the com for the community. And then some other small sites like Angel Village up top, uh, the Gratitude Garden. Um, and some of those trail connections as I mentioned. Um, as we were looking at those, we thought there are a lot of opportunities here um, for visitor uh, interaction, especially in this visitor hub, which we'll touch on later. Um, second, we looked at the main hubs. So like I mentioned, visitor hub. There's also the clinic up top, and we um, identified that as an area that could be uh, built upon as an employee hub, and then the hub that starts to form around the gratitude gardens. So um, third, we looked at the employees and operations on the site. Um, and as Tyler was mentioning, the organic growth has led to this kind of disbursement of um, facilities across the site, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. However, it does lend to a little bit of confusion. Um, and we saw that as a challenge and an opportunity. Um, we also recognized that the majority of the employee operations currently are up on the top of the plateau. Um, and we recognize that as an opportunity when separating the uses of visitor and employee. So, which leads to this fourth diagram. Um, this is basically just showing access zones, what we thought would be the most useful in accomplishing that goal of inspiring uh, visitors and providing for the employees. 
So the green here, uh, the canyon bottom, would be primarily uh, dedicated to the visitors, um, really fostering that strong experience that will inspire them. And then the yellow, whoops, the yellow areas up here are the employee areas. That's where a lot of the operations go on currently and where expansion would happen. And then the red areas are, rest, are uh, preservation areas. Those are sensitive areas. You've got a lot of wildlife on site. We just stay away from those. So with that in mind, um, we identified three main project sites. Uh, first off, the visitor hub down in the center, the gateway to the sanctuary. Second, the gratitude gardens, um, where we recognize those donors who give so much for best friends. And then the employee campus, um, taking care of those employees and additional employees that will be coming to best friends in the future. So starting with the visitor hub, um, this is kind of a zoomed out version. Uh, the visitor center sits right here currently, as does Horse Headquarters. We know Horse Headquarters is moving, and we saw that as a great opportunity um, to provide a space where those visitors can have a really engaging experience. Um, plus, the location is second to none. Um, it truly is the gateway as you're there in the canyon with those sandstone cliffs. Um, so we looked at a variety of things. We looked at vehicular circulation on the site, pedestrian circulation, um, meadows and providing open spaces where um, kind of unprogrammed events can happen. Animal interaction area, that was a key to this. Um, really getting people engaged with those animals so that they can be more inspired, um, get a better feel for what goes on in the sanctuary. And then a, a number of new um, buildings catered to those visitors and in, improving their experience. So these little sketches just show a couple of the ideas that we had for some of these small areas uh, catered to the visitors. Little outdoor classroom, uh, amphitheater spaces. Um, this could be a node on that animal interaction circuit. Maybe you've got cats in here and bunnies in here. Um, and then this is kind of the zoomed in illustrative showing those elements. So right in the center, you've got uh, the conference center. We're envisioning something that is flexible. Um, maybe incorporating some type of an indoor arena that you could hold equestrian events, host the community, have conferences, what have you. Um, it would be flanked by these kind of unprogrammed green spaces where you could have farmers markets, set up tents, variety of things, weddings. Um, here's that little uh, amphitheater I showed. And then the animal interaction area out here is really the focus of that, drawing people in and getting them involved with the animals. Um, we're also proposing a cafe on the site, help provide for those hungry visitors that happen to drop in, and um, a number of new visitor cottages down here. So these are just a couple of precedents, images that inspired us. Um, we loved this, these little kids getting involved with the animals, and we really feel that more animal interaction, especially for those drop-in visitors, is going to really help you um, further your cause. And then this uh, image up here uh, shows kind of how we're envisioning that interaction between the built environment and the natural environment, really engaging those two and bringing them together. And then this final one um, is a precedent that we looked at for that conference center. We liked the barn style and feel that it could add to the um, character of the canyon and really kind of pay homage to the horse headquarters that was there previously. On the track here is the Gratitude Gardens, um, tucked up on top of the plateau with the great views over the canyon, obviously. So um, we created a trail network that was simple and easy to understand. Uh, at first, we went through a bunch of different variations, and we realized that we could really connect trails in any certain way. Um, but it ended up being sort of this cobweb. And we wanted to make a simple loop on the outside with more of like a um, the main circuit on the inside with ADA accessibility. Um, so the welcoming gardens is shown in the green up there. That's sort of where you'd have more of the 25 um, lower scale donors, I guess, um, where people can really come and there's more public space and it's a open area. So we also have more medium scale intricate gardens uh, speckled throughout the trail systems and then five or six um, grand view gardens. So um, we picked plants based on color palette, uh, texture, contrast, and smells, um, stuff that would be um, hardy in your climate. Uh, and we also uh, took Demetrius Picionis, who uh, did stonework around the Parthenon. Um, he took 
rock from the local area and really picked each piece and put them in its place where it belonged and it felt like it almost was there on its own. Um, it's designed obviously, but it really pulls together the natural elements of the space. And um, talked to BLM um, office, I can't remember his name, but said the Shinnerump um, pit would be good. It, it's uh, boulders, you can get cobble, sandstone, and stuff like that. It's about $12 a ton. Uh, you'd have to pick them up yourself. They don't really help you out with that. But yeah. um, So this is sort of a synthesis of the design, um, reiterating that we have the common plaza that we've designed, your uh, labyrinth that currently exists there, council circle, and the variety of gardens, along with some of the view sheds that would be associated with those. Um, this is what it looks like as an illustrative, which is a little hard to see here, but we also have it the hand rendering right over there, so you can go check out each garden. Um, we highlighted a common plaza and also one of the more grand uh, gardens, just as examples of what could happen across the board. Um, so this is a current condition of where the common plaza may be. Um, these are used for uh, the animal graveyard, I guess, so it would be easily located um, just on the other side of the graveyard there. But this is a little zoomed in of the common plaza. Uh, we sort of have like an active space and more of passive areas, uh, potential for water features, uh, lots of rocks and seating areas that you can work with. Um, and then this is where we picked uh, one of our grand gardens. It's tucked in on the edge of this uh, round berm, I guess, this rock wall. Uh, so it made the perfect spot for a park, pocket garden, really. Um, and with that, we had the trail loop in, and we put deciduous trees in a way to where you wouldn't really be able to see into the garden until you just peeked around the tree, and then all of a sudden, you have fantastic um, mixture of plants and places to sit and relax with your friends or just be on your own and really think about whatever, whatever comes your way. So um, on to the employee campus. Okay. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so that third area that we talked about up at the north end of the site is the employee uh, campus as well as uh, the Dogtown area. So in this area, there were two main issues that we wanted to address. Uh, first of all is with the dogs. Um, we know that these lodges up here get a lot of flooding uh, every time it rains and it's become more and more of an issue. And so um, that was one of the issues brought up to us that those really need to be relocated or something needs to be done about that. And so in addressing that, um, we looked and we identified the opportunity to create a new loop road here um, and then transplanting uh, those dog runs down along that loop, creating three kind of distinct dog areas that could also help create a hierarchy of spaces for those different levels of dogs. So this area up here currently houses a lot of red colored dogs that could be uh, become almost a primary or a, become primarily red collar dogs. Um, this area would become an intermediate area and then New Dog Town down here would continue to be an area for those adoption ready dogs. Um, the second issue that we looked at was the need for um, more office space for employees, um, improved office space for current employees and additional office space for those employees that will be coming to best friends in the near future. Um, and so we identified this area here adjacent to the existing clinic as a prime area for um, that development. And I'll explain a little bit more why on this next page. But um, zooming in, this area here is pretty flat. It's very buildable and it's central to all of those employee operations going on on that um, upper uh, plateau area. So we thought that that would be a perfect location to put this. Um, we liked the idea of bringing all the employees together, kind of that consolidation idea that Tyler was talking about at the beginning, um, improving the communications, everything between those employees by shrinking the distance. Um, and we went through a variety of concepts. The first concept that we explored in depth had um, just a number of large buildings on that site. And that was met with not the best of feelings by everyone. Um, and in the end, I'm really glad that we had those conversations because um, this concept that we came up with, the final concept, looks at um, incorporating a variety of small, um, maybe modular type office units that would be unique, each of them in their own aspect, 
um, would provide the employees with their own space, somewhere that um, they really feel an attachment to, but that also remains in that close proximity, provides for opportunities for employees to interact, bump into each other um, as they're walking around, and that um, facilitates that ease of communication between, uh, between employees. Um, and so these images down here just show kind of some of the possibilities for what we're envisioning for these smaller buildings. Um, and the possibilities are endless, like they talked about with 400 acres. Zipkit provides a lot of these type of little modular things, and um, it just creates so much flexibility. But in the end, it's creating that strong um, employee community up there. So uh, that's what we have. Thank you guys for being here, and we'll turn it over for questions. All right. Um, so we are the connectivity team. My name is David, this is McKenna. Um, we also worked along with uh, David Durfee and Donna Lynn. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to immediately start thinking about being connectivity is what makes the people that come to Canab or come to Best Friends connect. Um, what are their commonalities? And so we started thinking of the values uh, that they each have. And so between tourists, Best Frienders, and residents of Canab, um, we found that you share a lot of values. Um, and so the things that we specifically focused on are your stewardship over the land, the community, that sense of community you're providing, and the history of the place. Um, ironically, these same values are what push you apart. Um, and it's a challenge to perhaps make you feel like you belong. And so our goal was to come up with something that brought people back together using these common values um, and giving even the tourist who's there for the first time a sense of belonging. Um, and that leads to being able to, be co to, to coexist um, with each other. This is strengthened through what we've determined as a network of trail systems. Um, the reason why we chose trail systems is not only does it physically connect places, but uh, as Les uh, Alonzo just mentioned, it's these chance encounters. Um, it won't just be the best frienders on the trails. It's not just the residents. It's not just the tourists. Um, it's the interaction of all of these users. Um, again, we understand that there is a friction uh, between types of users. Um, but that's what makes Canab great, is that it can accommodate all types. Um, so one of, one of the great networks that we looked at um, is known as the Emerald Necklace. Um, so back east we have a system or a network of parks. Um, if you at any point in time break this connection, the system itself fails. Um, and so that's what we're trying to make Canab uh, become, is a strong net network that um, continues to improve the, these connections. Right now, we have parts of a system created, um, but are needing to be strengthened. Um, so what we've come up with in our trail system development plan are three key points in how to, uh, I guess, one, promote your uh, network. And so the promotion is how do you let people know what you have to offer, but how do they get a hold of that material? Um, is it consolidated in one place? Is it spread out? Uh, making people aware. As it's been mentioned throughout this presentation, uh, Canab is, is easily passed through. And so we want to make people aware what is here, what the destination points are, and that there is value to staying. And then what we need to do to improve um, what we have, what amenities are lacking, and perhaps it's, it's simply access to water, um, a clearer trailhead, or you know, these simple amenities that make life easier um, when you're participating in these activities. All right. Oh. Okay, so the first part of the trail system development plan is promotion. And so we looked at, in particular, areas within Kanab that were destinations. So that's what the red dots represent. These are areas on Google Earth where a number of people have posted photos of really unique scenery. 
But like was mentioned before, currently these are bypassed by the national parks. And so Kanab itself is used as a gateway to get to these other places, but we really wanted to extend the stay of visitors within Kanab as well, and also make residents aware of the unique opportunities and destinations that are within the city. So with the help of Matt Brown here, we worked to develop a trail system campaign, Destination Kanab, and we took a center a point off the center of Center Street in Maine to develop these different radii. So four blocks, four miles, 14 miles, 40 miles. And we looked at destinations specifically within each of the radii. So here's each of those increments broken up. And you can see that within four blocks here, we've got access to five trailheads. And within each of the different increments, they also appeal to various user types. So within the four blocks, we're looking at those trails that might appeal to more passive recreation. And then within 14, those that are looking for higher, higher recreation. <laughs> so distribution awareness was the next part of the trail system development plan. So along with the power of creating networks, we wanted to look at not just distributing different components of the network, but to consolidate everything into something that could be distributed to all users. So we looked at consolidating all of the trails and ways that we could appeal to the various users. So we've got the logo here again, and this is an app that would have all the consolidated information on it, and users could go and use while they're hiking. Also a catalog, so this is something that could be mailed out to residents as well as best friends, employees, something that they could use to be aware of the, the trails in their, their own backyard and develop things as well. So having just a really clear trail map here, not to be confused with all the other trail systems, a really clean, clean title bar. So it's got the user types here. We've got the blocks and then a description of the trail, the logo again. So this is another way for users to be able to have options as well for something that would really be suited towards them. So wayfinding as well, so applying this same campaign, two ways, signs to direct you to the trailheads and also advertising instead of promoting just a singular trail or destination with Kanab, we're promoting the whole system here and directing them to a place where they can have access to all of it and then see for themselves what would be suited more towards their needs. So the last part is trail enhancement. And for this, we looked at a lot of precedents and we wanted to um, look at a trail specifically within Kanab that we looked at during the charrette that we thought would be a really good example. We could apply these principles and you could apply them to all the other various trails within Kanab. So the trail we, at the start of the charrette, we saw the interesting connection in the Kanab Creek and how that was really a vital part and not only a connection between um, best friends in Kanab, but it had a lot of beautiful scenery, a lot of destination sites along it. So the Coal Creek Canyon is a great precedent within Cedar City. It's got a lot of similar conditions to Kanab Creek. So we've got the road here and the trail. And this is where the trail based off slope could potentially go for the Kanab Creek Trail. And we've got about triple the distance here to work with than this tight trail system. But really, we've got a lot of users that use this trail. And we've got a lot of access points. Here's an access point to the Coal Creek Trail. There was a lot of interpretive signage here. Here's a historical signage. And then unique scenery, which we know Kanab has plenty of as well. So here's an inventory of that trail. We named it Ancient Footsteps. So there's a lot of unique destinations, wind carved caves. And here's some sketches that Carolyn did to show us a lot of those beautiful views that are along the trails well, starting from the bottom clear up, the best friends. So signage, here's some examples of signage that you could put along the trail. So again, we're including our logo on each of these signs here so that they know it's all a part of that consolidated system. So directional signage, we've got examples of that along the trail to orient people on where they are. We've got Informational signs, so this is telling a runner or a biker how far they're going, how far they've gone. 
also could be an opportunity for um, recreational races or different things like that. You could also, informational sign would include signs that would point out unique vegetation. An interpretive signage, so s signage that really connects people with the, the place, so whether it's telling about the history, which is something that both Best Friends and Canab really wanted to promote within the charrette. And then access, which is the last part. So we looked at areas, the peas, the orange peas are the areas where you could access the site from the trail from different points along Highway 89. And with each trail, there's different, depending on the users, it depends on what you would need at each of the trailheads. But here's basic things to consider for developing a trailhead as well as all trailheads really need to adapt to the existing grade and natural vegetation to protect that as well with. So here's an example of what that trailhead could look like for the Ancient Footsteps Trail. And then here's another example of what that trail could look like. And so we really believe that these three things could help develop Kanab into a destination. But as was said before, the importance of, or the power of networks is that all these components are working together. And so in order to make Kanab a true destination, we've got to have the parties that coexist within a, within a particular area work together to create this beautiful destination. And I'd like to end with a quote from yours truly, Todd Johnson. Um, Connection allows us to participate in the wider meaning of the place in which we live. And that is our presentation. Well, they've asked me to um, kind of wrap up uh, this thing, and how do you wrap that up? You know, I, you know I'm, I'm not sure how you do that. But what I would like to say is this is what you get from combining a, a really good client that Todd talked about earlier with a the A team <laughs> of uh, senior classes. These guys are incredible and they have worked hard. They're ingenious. Um, they're, they don't hesitate to get in uh, deeper than they should and um, staying up later than they should and all of those kinds of things. So. We get really nice stuff when you combine those two things together. And I think we're really fortunate that this has happened this way, that we had such a great client, such a great region to, to focus on, and such a great bunch of students to be doing all of that work that they did. I, I don't know what you guys saw, but you know, I saw trail systems that I got really excited about. Um, connecting things that would just increase values all over the place. I saw gardens that uh, if you guys built that gratitude garden, I can guarantee you my wife would never let me pass the entrance to best friends even at midnight, without going in and walking around that trail to see those gardens. That is a world-class opportunity in my mind. Uh, just a spectacular thing. I used to get asked all the time when I would work on something, would you live there? Would you work there? And if so, why? And if not, why not? And <clears throat> I, I sat and looked at this stuff as these guys presented. And yeah, I would live there, no question. 
uh, and give me one of those little units <laughs> and my Sheltie and I'd be there in a heartbeat. <laughs> and <clears throat> uh, would I work there? Absolutely. I, you know, what a, how could you possibly, and I'm talking about uh, Kanab as well as best friends. Kanab is a beautiful little city. And I just saw ideas of how to get, you know, the, the downtown into a situation where the locals have all kinds of stuff to enjoy and use. The visitors are going to be more inclined to want to stop and participate. And overall, it's, you know, if those things are done, Kanab's going to be a successful city, no question about it. I saw plans for a motel that I thought was the neatest thing I've ever seen. And, you know, I'd stay there in a heartbeat, no question. Even if I didn't have a pet, I'd stay there because it's setting a bar for sustainability for the whole community. Um, Alicia said earlier, nobody, nobody's done that stuff yet <laughs> in, in Kanab. You know, that's going to be a number one kind of thing. And um, boy, I, you know, when, when you look at the plans of how a new conference facility can be integrated into that overall scheme and how it links to neat little stuff happening all through the thing and how circulation has been simplified and dealt with in a, in a really refined manner. Um, those, are, those are dynamite plans that can go a long ways, no question. So I don't know how you end this other than another I can stand over here. I just wanted, on behalf of Best Friends, to thank you all very, very much for the incredible work that you've done here. It's very moving. And I think the real essence of the moving, movingness of it is the fact that, um, you know, 33, I think it was, years ago when we arrived there, and Francis and I were two of the people who first stepped foot on the land. Actually, Francis found it. Um, so he deserves a round of applause for finding such an incredible place. <laughs> but as we said about caring for animals, which was our, our number one concern, and our secondary concern was the place. It inspired us so much. Um, we, you know, I, I think you know, we started just building a place ourselves. I used to do all the uh, uh, utilities, the water pipes and the electricity and stuff. Francis used to do the telephones. And, you know, we all had our little part, part of it, part in it. But the one thing that we, uh, the two things that we respected was the priority of the animals and the beauty of the place. And we always had a principle of, you know, don't tear down any of the trees, don't disturb anything you don't have to disturb. And we disturbed a minimal amount. And what I see and what I really appreciate in what you've done is a continuation of those two principles and observing the, the, those priorities. And that makes this, for me, and in addition to all the inspiration, the energy, the ideas, the, uh, the creativity which you brought to it, that makes me feel this is a really special relationship. And we really appreciate your sensitivity and your creativity that you brought to it. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us at Best Friends. <laughs>